and how it can be activated in our hearts. And Many times we can come on a Sunday morning and we can stand in this room and we can sing the words to so many songs, yet there's something inside of our heart that maybe it's something that we walked through this week, maybe a diagnosis that you received this week, maybe a family issue or a loss of a loved one that just crushes your heart and it crushes your soul and it wavers your faith. Or am I the only one that ever experiences that in their lives? Where our faith begins to waver and we begin to question, God, can you really blank? God, are you really listening to me? And our faith begins to kind of dissipate. And 
maybe you're in this room today and you're listening to my voice and you're saying, that's me right now, right here, right now at this hour. I don't even know if I have faith in God. Well, I believe that we're here to be reminded today that God is faithful. That God is listening to your prayer and to my prayer. And that it does not matter where you are in your walk with Christ or what you're experiencing right now, this very hour. I want you to be encouraged that God knows, and God listens, and God is hearing your every prayer. And so as we sing this next song, let this song be your declaration to God today. Let this song begin to grow and strengthen your faith this morning because God can, God will, and we serve a God.
believe there's people who came here today who are saying, I, I need to see what the Lord can do. Maybe you came today looking for hope. You came today looking for peace. You came today looking for a miracle. You need a miracle, a new miracle in your marriage or with your kids or in your finances or at a job. And here's what I want us to know is that we are coming to the right place, the right person, and that's the God, that anything is possible. I just feel as if I want us to take a moment and let's ask God to do the impossible today. And so today, if you're saying, man, I came here and I just need God to move. I need God to show up. I need God. Maybe you're just going, I'm not even sure that God can do it, but I came hoping that he will. Right where you are, we just open your hands in front of you. I want to pray. Just as a way of just saying, God, whatever you have, I want to receive it today. Father, you know where every person in this room is. You know what's going on in their life. You know exactly what they need, Father. And I ask that you would meet them there today. God, that you would show up. You'd give comfort. You'd give peace. You'd give confidence in who you are and what you want to do in their lives, God. God, I pray that you, you, you give them confidence to trust you, to step out in faith, to do what you've told them to do. They've been holding back. God, that you move them to a place of obedience, God, so that you can and you will show up. Father, I pray that you you rescue those who, man, they they feel just tied down by maybe addiction or, or struggle with sin. God, will you rescue them this morning and set them free? I pray for marriages that that maybe some believe, uh, God, God, that they're 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 dead. They're gone. God, you resurrect the dead this morning, Jesus. Restore the marriages to new. God, you be glorified in all of it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take a seat. We're so incredibly thankful that we have an opportunity to go before God in spite of where we are. And we're grateful that you are here with us in this room today and those of you that are watching online thank you so much for tuning in and uh, joining us today and for sharing the link with family and friends and people that you know Uh, we're so grateful for you i tell you what everybody in the room let's just give them a round of applause for just joining us today and making them feel welcome part of our in-house service here and we're grateful to you those of you that are in our room today whether you've been with us from the beginning or you are new here We're grateful that you've chosen Grace Fellowship as a part of your week. And we've been praying for each and every person, each and every seat. We've been believing that God is going to speak to each and every person here and online today through what is sung, through what is shared, and through the God's word, God's message. And so thank you guys so much. I'd be honored if you would go ahead and take your cell phone out. Check that ringer on your cell phone. Make sure it's on silent. And then there is a QR code that's located in the seat back in front of you. I'd love for you to go ahead and scan that really quick. It's going to take you to a link that has so many things happening in the life of our church. And uh, I'll share just a couple here in just a moment. And then I'll be back up at the end of the service to share a few more things happening this month. Um, One of the first things I want to draw attention to is if you are new to Grace, there's that first tab that says I'm new or new here. I'd love for you to just click that little tab there. It's just a simple way to connect with us and us to connect with you. There are no strings attached, just a simple way to have that, to begin that connection. The other thing that we share about each and every week is giving, generosity. Uh, We talk about generosity from the stage, not because we want your money or need your money. It's not about that, but we talk about what God uh, has asked us to do as a part of worship to him, as a part of giving back to him. It's a, it's a, it's a way that we can, uh, connect with God through what through our heart and what God is trying to tell us and show us and even teach us in generosity giving and so we have that opportunity to to be able to learn from him and to walk in that obedience and being obedient to what he's asked us to do not because he wants your money but he wants the condition of your heart and that's what we're that's what he wants and desires from each and every one of us and so whether you've been on that on that generosity journey for a long time or you're just now starting, I know of a couple of folks that just began um, their journey of generosity just a couple of weeks ago. And I know that God is blessing them. And I know that they've made that choice, not because we've asked them to, because 
but because they are choosing to do so because they believe that that's a part of their relationship with Christ. And so if you want to continue to do so, you can do so through the giving, uh, through the giving tab, through the generosity boxes in the room and also out in the lobby. Pastor Chris is on his way up here in just a moment. We're continuing our series called Planted. And so you can check, you can click that tab that says sermon notes and follow along. There's also a sermon note card in the seat back in front of you. If you are a paper and pen type of note taker, um, uh, we've said it often. Pastor Chris has, has been saying for a while now, and we're just repeating what he says, that note takers are note takers are world changers. And so we'd be honored if you would do that because we believe when you go back and, and watch and go back and read uh, what God has been speaking to you through the message, we know that you're continuing to grow in your faith and we want you to continue to grow in your faith. And so we're excited for that. So open hands, open hearts, open minds to what God has for us today. And then I'll be back up at the end of the message to share some final thoughts with you. We're so glad you're here. God bless you. What a great day to be at Grace. Aren't you glad you came to church? Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I think we can do better than that. Aren't you glad you came to church? Yeah. yeah. I'm excited to be here. I'm Chris. I'm the lead pastor here. If I haven't met you, I would love to meet you and love for you to be a part of our Grace family. We are in a series called Planted, all right? And we've been just talking about uh, how what we find in Scripture about agriculture, how it applies to life today. Um, and last week... Uh, the guy who spoke was Brandon, one of our own, and, and he outed me that I have an ag degree, but that is not why we're talking about it. I just need to put my degree to use, I guess. I'm just kidding. Um, but, but I'm excited. Uh, it's been a great series. If, if you haven't been with us during the series, I would encourage you to go back online. We have it on our podcast, on our website, on the different social media sites. would love for you to catch up because it's been very challenging. I do want to say this up front, though. If you're new to church, you're not so sure what you believe or if you believe, um, and you're just checking out the God thing, uh, maybe someone promised to buy you lunch if you came. I'm glad you're getting lunch out of it, all right? But I want you to know you are in the right place because ultimately, our hope is this is a place where you can journey with God and experience Him for yourself at your speed, at your, in, in your time. Uh, and, and we hope that you'll ask questions when you're ready to ask questions because my prayer for you and our hope for you is that you'll experience Jesus just the way that I have in a way that has forever changed my life and is for the better. And I think he will do the same for you. So today, before we get rolling in, in uh, our, our series, we're going to actually be talking about the main reason that Jesus came and how we should respond if we're followers of Jesus to that mission. But before we do, I just want to pray and ask God to speak to us in our time together. Father, Thank you that we get to gather, and God, that you have guided us and given us truth to live by. Now, God, will you help us hear from you this morning? Holy Spirit, fill this place, fill our hearts, uh, so we can see you and know truth like never before, and that it will change our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this series is a series that God stirred in my heart a year ago. As I was, uh, each year I, I read through Scripture um, from through the Bible from beginning to end, just in my own growth, in my own time. And one of the things I started noticing last year was how often Jesus used agricultural illustrations when he was teaching. He, he, he 
compared our life and follow him and our spiritual life to, to agricultural uh, illustrations time and time again. And now here's the thing. There's some of you that, that this resonates with you because you are a pro at gardening. You can grow anything, anytime, anywhere. You tr- you're, you've got a green thumb. Everything lives and you speak its language somehow. There's others that I know that, listen, you can't keep a fake plant alive, right? You're like, man, this isn't me. That's like Brandon last week, right? But here's the thing. Jesus used this illustration pretty much more than any other illustration. And probably because it was an agricultural society, that's probably part of it. They all understood how it worked. Um, but, but maybe beyond that, it's because there is truths in nature that are true then that are still true today. Uh, for example, week one, Ro- Pastor Rocky talked about the idea that what you, uh, what you sow will determine what you reap and what you grow, right? That's, that was true then. It's still true today. Then week two, Pastor Jeremy talked about the idea that in a field there's wheat and there's weeds. And he said, don't worry about pulling the weeds out with the wheat. We'll do that at harvest time. Why? Well, the agricultural reason is because if you do that, it disturbs the root zone and messes up your, your crop. It messes up the harvest. It was true then. It's still true today. And last week, Brandon talks about the idea that, that a branch that's not connected to the vine can't produce anything. Now, hopefully that wasn't mind-blowing to anyone. They were like, what? I never knew that, right? But, but why is that important? Why does he use that? Because he, he's using something to help us understand that there are some truths that remain true across all time. And there's so much of that that we see in nature. And today's truth is no different um, Growing gardens has been, or, or agriculture and, and, and producing vegetables and things like that. It's been a part of my family for a long time. I mean, growing up, uh, I helped my parents. My parents had a, a garden uh, that we always had to go pick stuff from and shell peas and all that. I actually weed the garden, right? I always felt like it was punishment. They said it was just a responsibility. I was like, what did I do wrong? And so I was, I was out there a lot. So I think it was a punishment uh, doing those things. Um, but, but beyond that, I actually have a great grandfather that in East Texas had fields of crops. He actually had four canneries where he would can the vegetables and, and ship them actually to uh, the to the troops in World War II. I mean, he, was, he had a big operation. It's been a part of our family for a long time. And so a couple years ago, um, my, or a few years ago, my wife and I finally had a place where we could build our own garden and I could put my degree to use. And so I geeked out, built the raised beds, brought in good soil, brought in compost, uh, planned the garden so I could make sure I plant, planted companion plants next to each other, all right? That's not plants that hug each other. They help each other grow, all right? There's my degree at work. Um, and then we, we watered it, and it began to grow, and, and, and eventually it started producing. Each plant grew at different rates and produced at different rates. But, but I did the same thing. Every time I saw squash and zucchini on the, on the plant or, or, or the first time we saw the jalapenos or the, the, the melons beginning to produce or the, the pea pods, I Googled, when do I know when it's time to harvest, right? Because I wanted to make sure I got it in the right window of harvesting. Because if you harvest too early, it's not very good. If you harvest too late, it'll rot on the vine or, 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 or it won't be very good. And the reality is, is if you wait too late to harvest, the, the plant actually believes that it, growing season's over and it'll stop producing. And so the, the, this window of harvest is crucial. The time is of the essence. And it's important because when it comes to gardening and growing a vegetable garden, you don't just grow vegetables so you can look at them. (laughs) You you grow vegetables so you can bring them in and enjoy the harvest. That's the purpose. That's the goal. And and when it comes to the church, we, we must understand the goal or the mission, the purpose behind the church, the, the mission of the church. Like it matters. And among those who are followers of Jesus, maybe grew up in church, you've heard about church, you've been around church, so often there's so many different ideas of what the goal of the church should be. It should be helping people be better people and do better things and be more moral or or to help people get more spiritual or or, or to uh, help gather people around who have the same mindset and way of looking at life, to educate people about what the Bible 
teaches. And while some of these things happen at church, whether those things are right or wrong, none of those are why the church exists. See, the church was never meant to be an organization or an institution. It was meant to be a, 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 a group of a people, a gathering of people who operate together to carry out the mission of Jesus. So if we want to understand the mission of the church, we must first understand the mission of Jesus. The good news is God has shown us what the mission of Jesus is. In the New Testament, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are four different people who are eyewitnesses to Jesus' life that God used to record what the, the events of Jesus' life and the things that he taught. And as we begin to look at his life, we can see his mission. And today I want to look at Matthew chapter 9, where we see this mission. Matthew was one of Jesus' close followers, one of the disciples. And this is what he tells us about Jesus. In Matthew 9, verse 35, says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. There's his purpose. We see it up front in that his goal was to spread the good news, the good news of the kingdom that he came to establish. And it wasn't a physical kingdom, but it was a spiritual kingdom that he came to establish established here on earth. See, we need to understand that we're not just physical beings. That, that Yes, God created us with physical beings, but we're created in his image spiritually so we can be connected to God in a relationship. See, people often feel this need inside of, man, there's got to be more to life than this. What's my meaning? What's my purpose? There's got to be more to life than just going to, to work and paying the bills and getting old. And the reality is answers to these questions are only found in the kingdom that Jesus came to establish here on earth. And he came to establish his kingdom on earth to fix a problem that our sin created. See, we all sin. Sin is when we do things our own way instead of God's way. It's rejecting his authority in our lives. It's trusting our way over God's way. It's, it's following our desires rather than God's design. There's so many ways to say it. The reality is we all sin. And sin brought death into uh, this world. It brought death and destruction. And, and in fact, uh, it, it's also called the curse of sin. And the curse of sin brought spiritual and physical death. It, it brought spiritual death by breaking our relationship with God, the only one who can satisfy the deepest need of our soul. It's the reason we're asking, what's the meaning of life? There's got to be more to life. Seeking satisfaction everywhere we can look. We're cut off because of sin. It also brought physical death and destruction. It's why there's pain and heartache and sorrow and death in this world. In fact, God used a man named Paul to explain it uh, in, in uh, his letter to the Romans. He wrote to a, a letter to the Romans. God had him write this letter to explain how sin affects us and how faith begins to change what sin has done. And in Romans chapter 8, he explains the problem that we have, that all of creation against its will was subjected to the curse of sin. When we chose to reject God, sin entered the world. And all of creation was subjected to it. It's the reason my back hurt this morning when I got out of bed. It's the curse. The reality is, is that Jesus came to reverse the curse. That was the good news. He, he was establishing a new kingdom to restore what was broken by our sin. It's why he said things when he taught, like, I came to seek and save the lost. Uh, he, he said things like, I came to, to give people a full and satisfying life. I came for those who know they are sick and in need of a doctor. He said, I came to set the captives free so that when we ask the question of there's got to be more to life than this, life's got to be better than this, is there meaning, is there purpose? Jesus said, I came to help you find that because I came to fix what was broken by sin. See, and he says that he was teaching the good news about the kingdom, this new kingdom that he came to establish. But it also says he was healing all sicknesses, all kinds of sicknesses and disease. And here's why that's significant. Because Jesus was performing miracles. And the miracles were proof of his power over the effects of sin. He, he was... He was uh, demonstrating his power over the physical effects so that we would trust him with the spiritual effects. 
He was demonstrating that he could overcome the effects of sin physically so that we would trust him spiritually. And crowds of people were witnessing this and and, and just going to see Jesus every time they heard about him because they loved what he taught. He was so positive. They were encouraged. They were great vibes. It brought a little hope, a little peace to them. Not only that, when he did the miracles, it was amazing. It was was like, man, I got to see that with my own eyes. Next time we hear where Jesus is, we're going. The crowds would flock to him. There are many fans of Jesus who even agreed with a lot of what he taught, and they were excited about what he was doing, but many still didn't know who he was personally. They were fans, but they weren't followers. And and, and what's crazy is that many in the crowd were Jews who'd grown up hearing about and praying for and waiting for the one that they called the Messiah, which was the anointed one or the appointed one. And it was one that they were waiting for that God had promised who would come and rescue mankind from sin. And even though he proved that he was the Messiah by fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that were made hundreds of years before Jesus came to the earth, they still didn't believe in him. They still wouldn't receive him. Even the religious elite who knew the scriptures better than anyone else didn't believe because he didn't align with their expectations. He didn't align with their traditions and religious behavior. So the crowds would flock and hear the things that Jesus taught, but they would never allow the things that Jesus taught to change the way they believed and lived. It goes on and says this, that when the crowds, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So so when he looked out at the crowds, He didn't see a problem. He saw a great need for the good news. He saw their condition and their lack of faith and their lack of belief. And he he didn't condemn them. He didn't criticize them. Instead, he had compassion on them. He didn't get on on his soapbox about how evil and messed up and bad these people are. He didn't condemn them for the way they acted and their worldliness. He didn't blast them on face scroll. He he didn't say, he didn't say, all right, I know what I'm about to say isn't popular and it's probably going to tick people off, but I just have to speak the truth. Do you realize that Jesus always spoke the truth? But he did it in love. And yet the only people we ever see get mad at Jesus about the things that he said were the religious elite, were the hyper-religious. See, Jesus didn't condemn them. He saw the crowd and their outward behavior as an indication of their inward condition. And he had great compassion on them. He said he saw them and they were harassed and helpless. Who were they harassed by? Our enemy, Satan, whose desire is to steal, kill, and destroy. He is the father of lies. He's the great deceiver. He's looked at them and went, man, they're harassed. They're helpless. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They, They don't have hope. See, see, in that time, they understood what a shepherd would do and, and that sheep without a shepherd were exposed and vulnerable to any attack, to any predator. They were easily, would wander off from the rest in search of greener pastures and become subject to any predator. See, he saw them as harassed and helpless And instead of condemn the crowd for their condition, he saw the great need, had compassion on them. Let me ask you, is that the way you see our culture today? Do we have compassion because they're helpless and harassed by the enemy? Like sheep without a shepherd looking for hope their own way. See, instead of being stirred with anger, he was stirred with a deep compassion for them. It goes on and says this in verse 37, that then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 
See, he saw the need, and he saw the need that it was a great opportunity. He said, man, look at the harvest. Our great, the great need is a great opportunity. He saw the harvest and said, man, the harvest is ripe. It's ready. Listen, we see this great need today. Our culture is a mess. We don't have to look far to see that. There's conflict. There's confusion. The country's more divided. Uh, marriages and families are under attack. With social standards, what is decent and moral and courteous and, and, and right and, and respectable, it, it's pretty much disappeared. Our culture is like sheep wandering around looking for greener pastures, looking for meaning and purpose in life looking for satisfaction, but they can't get no satisfaction. And here's the deal. As they chase satisfaction, they're just becoming easy prey for the enemy. There's a great need that is actually a great opportunity. There's a story about a shoe salesman, actually a shoe company in England in the early 1900s, who wanted to expand their market into the, to Africa. And so he, they sent two shoe salesmen to survey the market, one to the East Coast, one to the West Coast. And the first one called back and, and sent them through Telegraph, hey, um, there's no market here. No one wears shoes. Don't bother. The second one sent back, the market is huge. The opportunity is huge. No one wears shoes. Send inventory. The only difference was the way that they saw the situation. See, we can see the condition of our culture as a major problem, or we can see it as a great opportunity. And Jesus goes, the opportunity is great. It's great, but we need more harvesters. We need more people who have been found to go help find more people. We need the people who have been reached to, to continue helping reach more people. And time is of the essence. There is a window for harvest, so there should be an urgency for reaching people with the good news. And that's where some of us struggle. For many of us, we just put it off and think, well, I'll get involved one day, but we've got great pastors. Isn't that their job? We put it off and think, well, one day I'll get involved. One day I'll get serious about my faith. One day when I'm not so busy. One day when I reach a certain place in my career or when I retire or when I, we always have the when I's. And our lack of urgency is simply evidence of our spiritual apathy. And for many, we, we don't ever get involved until it begins to affect our comfort. It becomes an inconvenience. See, when it comes to harvesting, time is of the essence. There's a window of opportunity, and I believe God is showing us that the opportunity is now. There's a great need, and there's a great opportunity, and God has placed Grace Fellowship exactly where it is to be great harvesters in his field. I believe that we have a great opportunity to make a great impact for his kingdom. Great opportunity to make a great impact. To be harvesters that help others find what we have found. To invite others to come and experience God for themselves. To see the lives of our friends and families and co-workers. And others in our community forever changed by the gospel. Here's what I think. Probably most of us who are followers of Jesus, there's probably someone in our lives, maybe our family, friends, co-workers, that we go, man, God, God, I hope you'll reach them. I've got family members that, that I pray for, and I, I pray, God, will you reach them? God, will you draw them to yourself? God, God, will you, will you have someone show up in their lives and invite them to experience you for themselves? What if God wants you to be the answer to someone else's prayer for their loved one? To be the harvester who shows up in their life and, and, and says, hey, I, I found something that I think that you may want to find out about. Hey, come and experience this for yourself. Come and check this out. It's changed my life. I think it can change yours. See, we have an opportunity to make an impact that could change the eternity of others in our community. So how do we seize the opportunity? Well, Jesus says, ask God to send out more workers into the field. First thing is simply to pray for more harvesters. 
God, will you, will you raise up harvesters? Will you raise up workers? Will, not, not just me, but, but those around us. God, will you, will you empower us and, and, and impassion us with the desire to do this together? That we pray for more harvesters. Ask God to raise up people who are passionate about reaching people. However necessary, I've been praying that God would raise up the next generation of pastors and church leaders because there's more people getting out of full-time ministry than getting into full-time ministry. But it's not their job to do all the harvesting. In fact, God told us this uh, through his letter um, to the Ephesians through Paul. He says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility, this is their job is to say this with me, equip God's people. We're going to try that again. Say this with me, equip God's people to do his work, to be harvesters and to build up the church, the body of Christ. We're here to grow together and to become harvesters together to seize the great opportunity that God has given us. We need to pray for harvesters, but we must participate in harvesting. That that we must step out and say, God, how can I be a part of what you want to do? In fact, in the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends his disciples out as harvesters. He says, all right, I'm going to send you out by twos and you go and teach what I've been teaching and do what I've been doing. And then at the end of Matthew, just before Jesus leaves the earth, he commissions all of us. It's a co-mission. He's inviting us to join him in this mission, to go and make disciples, to become harvesters wherever God has planted you. See, a lot of times people go, isn't that the pastor's job? No, you have a, you're a better position to be harvesters than I am because God has planted you right where the harvest is to invite others to experience what you've experienced, the ultimate goal of the church. It was the goal of Jesus on the earth to spread the good news and to bring people into the kingdom. There's several ways that you can do that personally. One is simply tell your story. You don't have to have it all figured out. You've got a story of how God showed up, how God met you at your your deepest, darkest times, how God moved in your life, how God rescued your marriage, how how God showed up uh, in in your job professionally, or or how, how God rescued you from an addiction. You have a story to tell. And no one can argue with your story. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have it all together. You can just say, I'm still a work in progress, but this is what God's done in my life, and I think he could change yours too. Tell your story and tell it often. But then also invite people. Invite people to come to church and sit with you where we're going to talk about truth. We're going to talk about what God's done. We're going to talk about how he's changed our lives. And we're going to invite others to experience him for himself. Get involved personally by telling your story, by inviting other people, but get involved by joining the church to advance the mission of the church by serving. And it's not because the church needs you to do things. It's because God wants to do something in you and through you that you could never do on your own. When you step up to serve, you step up to a place where you can experience God's power in your life like never before. Because two things happen when you serve. Your faith grows and God grows his kingdom. And there's so many ways that you can get involved here at Grace to serve. On a normal weekend, it takes around 360 people to carry out our mission as a church. Our mission is to inspire and equip people to know and follow Jesus. And so that's why we often say we want you to serve one and attend one or attend one and serve one. To join us in the mission to to inspire and equip people to know and follow Jesus. Listen, we, we, we don't do these things. We don't have these places to serve just so we can plug people in. It is strategic. Our hope and our heart is that from the moment people drive onto the campus, we're creating an environment that helps take the walls down and the anxiety that some people have about, about church, that when they walk through the doors, that they're shocked. They're like, man, I thought the walls would cave in on me, but these people like me and they're glad I'm here. This is awesome. We want to help people experience God for themselves. And there's so many ways that we can do that. Uh, I want to list a few. First is uh, first impressions. These are the, exactly that, it's the first impressions. 
It's the people like the, the greeters and coffee servers and cookie bakers and coffee makers and the, the reset team, people who are here between each service to make sure the room doesn't look like a tornado hit it for the next group, to reset the room. They have cleanup teams, the white glove teams who try to help make sure the, the facilities are still kept in a level of excellence. We have ushers who help people get seated when the auditorium is full. We have our parking team, which could be one of the most important teams that we've got. They are literally the first impression. We want to make it as easy as possible for people to walk through those doors and experience Jesus for themselves. For some, it's serving in pre-K where, where, where we uh, need people who, who feel blessed to get to hold babies and care for babies and, and pray for them and, and, and sh demonstrate the love of God in their lives at a young age so that mom and dad can come in here without worry, without concern, and be able to lean in and hear what God has for them every week. We need people who will serve in our elementary and our intermediate services. Listen, they're not babysitting or child care. They are full-on services with music and a message and activities that meet the kids right where they are with truths. They're on their level that they don't, they're not told that, you know, one day when you grow up, no, you can begin to follow God right now. Small group leaders, they break out into small groups where they encourage them and pray for them and build them up and help them connect that truth to everyday life. Same is true with our, our student ministry. We, we have middle school that meets uh, on Sunday mornings and high school meets uh, midweek on Wednesday nights. It's a service directed specifically for students. And if you are a student, you need to be there because there is a truth that, that they're going to talk about that applies to your life right where you are. Not only that, you'll be able to connect with other people in, a, in small groups afterwards and, and talk about how it fits with life and, and, and grow in community together with small group leaders who care about you and are going to pray for you and build you up and encourage you along the way. Uh, we have our safety team that helps keep the, the campus safe and secured during our services. We have our weekend experience, which is everything that happens in this room. It's, it's the things in front of the cameras and behind the cameras. There's people back there who push buttons and move slides, and, and they have to follow me with the camera every week, and sometimes I try to juke them just to keep them awake back there. They were ready for it because I did it last service. <laughs> I'll have to think of another way for next service. But, but there's other ways. You could be a life group leader, a life group host. So that's how we grow together as a church. We don't just gather in large groups. We gather in community to share life together, to grow together, to wrestle with the tough things of life together, to apply our faith together. We're meant to grow together. We need leaders who will step up and open their homes and just lead discussion. We have Grace Youth Sports, which is uh, unique to our church. It's meant to be a blessing to our communities, but as well as that, a bridge to connect people who don't have a place to connect here at Grace. So we need coaches who understand the mission of the church who invest in kids and, and, and encourage them, build them up. We need, we need officials who understand the mission of the church. We need people who will help uh, field crew, all right? We need a field crew that will help serve during the week to spray lines from time to time or show up on Saturday mornings to help set up the field early so that when people show up, it's ready to go and they have an excellent experience. It's meant to be a blessing. There's so many ways that you can serve Behind the scenes, we have a social media team. They're always kind of creeping around, all right? Taking pictures. You're like, who is that person? It's the paparazzi <laughs> that finally found you. There's so many ways to serve. The bottom line is simply this. God invites you to make a great impact by being a great harvester. You're invited by God. He, he does the work. You just, you just partner with him. You help bring in the harvest. You help other people experience them for, yourself, for themselves. Don't waste this opportunity to make an impact that will last for eternity. There's a great pastor and theologian who once said this. His name was Charles Spurgeon. He says, we need to see as Jesus saw and feel as Jesus felt. 
so that we will do as Jesus did. So the question is, do we see as Jesus saw? And when we see, do we feel as Jesus felt about the culture? And are we willing to do as Jesus did to bring in the harvest? God invites you to make a great impact by being a great harvester. Will you respond to that invitation? Maybe for some today, the, the, the invitation you need to respond to is the one that Jesus came to give. And it's an invitation of new life. It's an invitation uh, 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 of receiving forgiveness for our sin and, and him setting us free. We simply admit that we sin and we've all sinned. And we believe that Jesus came to the earth walked the earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross and rose from the grave, but he died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. That he took our penalty. That he rose from the grave so that he can forgive us of our sins. Maybe today you go, man, I don't have it all figured out, but I know I need that. And today you would say, man, I, I wanna put my trust in Jesus. I've sinned, I believe Jesus paid the penalty. And I wanna trust him with my life. It's not about perfection. It is a change of direction where you go, I'm done doing it myself. I want to know and follow him. And maybe that's the decision you need to make today. So as we close, I'm going to pray. And if you've made that decision before, I want you to simply ask God this. God, how do you want me to engage as a harvester this week? How do you want me to, 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 to respond to being a harvester right where you have me? For those of you who say, man, I need to put my trust in Jesus. I want to lead you in a prayer. The prayer doesn't save you. What saves you is you just being honest with God right where you are. So we bow your heads and close your eyes to eliminate distractions. And if you say, I need to put my trust in Jesus, tell him something like this. God, I know that I've sinned. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of my sin. I believe he rose from the grave. I don't have it all figured out, but I know I need you. So today I put my trust in you. I ask you to save me and forgive me. Will you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Change me from the inside out. And help me know you and follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. God, my prayer is for all of us who've found you. And you've rescued us. God, you show us how to be great harvesters that help others find what we have found. God, that you would make a great impact in our communities in this generation like we've never seen before. We give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris. What a powerful, powerful message. As always, you can go back and watch or listen through our podcast. Subscribe to our podcast so you can catch up if you have not been here or have not heard any of the other messages. We'd love for you to, to, to do that. Um, just a reminder, tonight is Leadership Summit. Um, if you are serving, um, you can find information through the QR code, what times you need to be here. If you're not currently serving here at Grace, we'd love that opportunity uh, to share with you about, as Chris said, what Grace Fellowship is all about. And so tonight, if you scan that QR code, you can find out information about that. And uh, we'd love, love to have you. We're looking forward to a great night here tonight. Uh, coming up on, the, on Tuesday is our movie, family movie night called Up. We're going to show the movie right here in this room. We'd love for you to be a part of that. We're celebrating throughout the week and into next Sunday, Move Up Sunday. We celebrate it every year. Maybe your kiddo is moving from one environment to another, and we want to celebrate with them as they change grades, as they change environments here at Grace Fellowship. And so we're going to celebrate Tuesday, and we're going to celebrate on Sunday. And so we are, we are going to celebrate them and what they have accomplished. And so moving into that next uh, grade level. Coming up on the 18th, 
of August is our Abide Night. If you have been around Grace Fellowship, it's a night of prayer and praise. We have an opportunity to sing together. We're going to take communion together, and we're going to pray. And so I'm going to invite all of you that are educators, teachers, administrators. We want to pray for you this night on the 18th. Some of you may already be in school. Um, the week prior to that, we understand that, but we would love it. if We'd be honored if you would be here that night so that we can pray for each and every one of you on that night for Abide Night. One last, a uh, couple of last things before we are dismissed. The men, we are hosting a men's event on the 25th of August right here at Grace Fellowship Church. Guys, go ahead and register today. It's $25. We'll have Jeff Little as our keynote speaker. He's pastor at Milestone Church in Keller. And so he's going to be here. We're going to celebrate together, have a good time as guys. And so you don't want to miss that. Invite your coworker, invite your neighbor, uh, invite your brother-in-law, your brother, whatever that looks like. Let's just, let's uh, gather up on the 25th. 5th of August. Prayer partners, I'm going to go ahead and invite you to come on down. And we're going to, they want to pray for you. If you have a specific prayer request, um, they would love to pray with you. We hope you have an incredible week. We'll see you tonight, or we'll see you Tuesday, or we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.